So, this is Stu and I'm at the beautiful Purple Valley and this time I'm interviewing Laruga Glazer and uh, she is from Philadelphia but based in Sweden, is that right? Or mm. am I wrong already? You're wrong. I'm <laughs> wrong already from... <laughs> I'm from Columbus, Ohio. From Columbus, Ohio. Where yeah. did I get Philadelphia from? <laughs> no idea. Probably thinking of cheeses and pizzas and God knows what. Yeah. So from Ohio, but now you're based in Sweden, is that right? Yeah, in Stockholm. In Stockholm, nice. Yeah. And I've been doing my research, so I've been talking to the students that are with regulars with you and talking to the students here at this particular retreat. And what I'm hearing all the time is, you're so inspirational, your adjustments are such fantastic, you're strong but still feminine, and everything is like super positive. And I must admit from my own experience as well, just some of the best adjustments I've received, you know, in, in the time I've been practicing. St the right strength for me, because obviously it's different for everybody needs different things, so mm -hmm. right for me, but also uh, very secure. There was a, one in particular, Pashasana adjustment, and it was like rock solid, and, and, but also really nice, the right strength for me in the adjustment. And that, that takes some doing, because Bodies like mine, you can't see under my nice shirt that I'm wearing today, but bodies like mine are, are quite hard and, and quite resistant to, to adjust sometimes. And mm. what I want to ask you first of all is what goes through your mind when you're adjusting and, and how do you approach it and how do you protect your own body when you're actually adjusting people that are much bigger than yourself? Because you're mm. quite petite, so mm. there's going to be a lot of bodies that are bigger than you. Yeah, so, you know, for me, it kind of starts with observing a student yeah. and uh, giving them some space and, uh, and seeing how they move. Um, uh, and then from that study of the student coming in and when I offer adjustment, usually I want to start from them feeling grounded. Yeah. So they feel like some type of connection to the earth, to the floor, so they can then find that space to kind of lift up again. Yeah. So it's really important that the student feels a sense of grounding. So I like to start there and then kind of start to guide them further or deeper into the pose, but doing it with the breath. So not just kind of coming in and Yeah, I really forth. noticed that when you were adjusting me as well, that definitely there was a sense, your breath was the same as mine, and obviously every student's breath is different. Yeah. But you like tuned in to me rather than trying to impose your breath on mine, which sometimes mm. I've had. And, yeah. and that was really nice because I knew where I was, as you say, I felt really grounded and secure. Mm. And then it seemed to be that the, you really um, tapered the strength of the adjustment in. So it was uh, very sensitive to how my body was going to receive it, but at the same time you had the reserve there to apply more strength in the adjustment if it was needed. Yeah, and I, I always like to have the sense when I'm adjusting a student that I'm inviting myself into someone else's energy. Right. So I don't want to come in barging and like acting yeah. as if I'm just going to impose some type of will or, or an energy that's not so... In inviting yeah. to someone so I kind of want to come in and feel their space and then have so they can have a sense of grounding also next yeah. having a sense of grounding and then coming in and deeping deepening the the, the practitioner or the student yeah. if so needed um, because I've also learned from my own experiences of being adjusted yeah. yeah I know what that can be like and how it can sometimes feel overpowering yeah um, but I like adjustments too, and but I, I always want this sense of respect with students, and and again, like I had said before, inviting myself into them, their space, yeah. feeling where they are. Um, the, my big thing is too, if there's no breath, if there's no deepening of breath, yeah. why should I push a posture further? Yes. So, so if they've lost control of the posture themselves already. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like it's so important that they have the breath and, and sometimes if I feel like the breath isn't as fine tuned as it could be, I'll breathe with them to remind them. Right. So I kind of, I'll come in, I don't want to like breathe down their neck or anything, <laughs> <laughs> but I come in and I just breathe gently with sound and yeah. sometimes it reminds you that, oh, okay, I'm yep. supposed to be breathing. Right. So, um, 
And then also just working with the energy, just feeling a softening. So sometimes when you adjust students, it's easy for them to want to really push against your adjustment or further it a little bit uh, too strongly. Right. And so I really want them to be trained to soften under my hands nice. and not necessarily feel like they need to harden or actually be more aggressive in and, the pose. And take it, just because you're there, take it further because you're there as well. Exactly. Nice. Exactly. And how do you protect your own body? Because adjusting, you can be in, uh, you're always in a semi-awkward position, or it's quite easy to put yourself in a semi-awkward position, particularly dealing with different size bodies, different heights, different mm. widths. So what's going through your own mind when you're getting yourself into position to adjust? I, m I have to be grounded too. That's really right. important. And it's interesting, like teaching in Sweden, most of the students are a bit bigger than me because yeah, yeah. in Sweden, everyone's quite tall. Yeah, they're Viking heritage. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah, like, so. it's a little bit overwhelming. And I do, sometimes I feel like a lot of the, you know, it tends to go into my hip. I have to be careful into my low back. Right. Um, but I try to make sure that I have a good sense of grounding myself yeah. if I'm going to help somebody else ground. Um, that I have a good sense of my own body. I think that's really important too. Okay. Um, but it's really interesting when you observe a student, you observe how they move. Um, there's been times I've had a, you know, you have, there's sometimes there's cookie cutter adjustments. Like there's kind of like these adjustments, you know, that can work on maybe like 60%. The set the standard, trick. this is the trick and asana adjustment or? To do yeah. yeah. But I've, al I've also learned when I, like there's been some students they maybe have special limitations or maybe it's their size compared to mine. And I've had to make up an adjustment as yeah. I go along. Um, but I know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to ground them. I'm trying to, I want them to get some type of lift and also possibly deepen them. Yeah. So it's also kind of knowing where the energy is going in a pose. And, and oftentimes I have to kind of be creative as I go along um, when it comes to uh, the size of my body compared to the student yeah. and these types of things. And then not just like on me, on that particular Pashasana example, you were using your forearm as a lever on my shoulder. We were going around this way. Mm. And mm. and that felt really nice. I mean, not that not the point of the elbow, <laughs> just to <laughs> encourage it back, but it was more like a softer, softer part of the forearm. And it mm. just felt like a really nice lever mm. and is that the, s the sort of things that you sort of adjust depending on the size of the person and and where your body is in relation to them yeah so i mean if someone has a little bit more if it's a little you know, you know you're you're a little bit of a bigger guy yeah. so i have to use a little bit more yeah. of my of my yeah. strength and i have yeah. to use what i have yeah. um, to make the pose effective or make the adjustment effective for yeah. you um, so, uh, you know, I, I try to, I want people to feel as comfortable as possible. Um, but also from my own practice, I've also learned how important it is to, to get a sense of lifting, especially in Pashasana, yeah. um, a sense of lifting. That's why also I focus on the head too, the yeah. placement of the head, because yeah. a lot of times people like to slump and then turn. Yeah. So I really like people to get those shoulders back so they can deepen their twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it could feel a little bit more alive. Yes, These yeah. These things are important for me. And do you ever, I had the feeling, and I might be completely on the wrong track here, but it just, for me, in this last week or so, I've received quite a few adjustments from you on twisting postures, shall mm. we say. Was that just coincidence, or do you sometimes theme your adjustments for certain individuals thinking, okay, maybe we'll target their twists or their forward folds or whatever. Is that the sort of thing that goes through your mind, or...? Was it just coincidence that it seemed that, that it was a lot of twisting postures? Mm. Or was I just a duffer at twist? <laughs> <and that> was, <laughs> I needed the most help in the twisting postures. Um, I really, I mean, personally, I really like twisting poses. Yeah. I think they're just so good for the internal organs, for the spine. Um, so personally, I love a, a good twist. Yeah. Um, but also, I think it's a little bit a coincidence sometimes for whatever reason, it seems to flow that way on yeah. a certain day. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also comes into play with observing, feeling the energy, um, just feeling what's good for that day. Or for some reason, it tends to be a pattern, yeah. which when you look back on, it's a little, always a little bit interesting. So, so not necessarily a conscious decision, but maybe mm -hmm. subconsciously things and energy influence you along that way. Yeah, and there's mm -hmm. many times when I teach, I might have a conscious decision that I want to do 
such and such. Right. But then the energy takes me someplace else. I don't like, so I try to be open to that. Yeah. So I find that really interesting, just being open. There's also a sense of like when I teach, just emptying myself so I can be filled with something like a greater guidance as I like move through the room. And sometimes it's really out of my control. Um, but at the same time, I think it's good maybe to have some type of, um, maybe you can have certain things that you want to focus on with students and things like that. But I, I tend to more kind of go with the flow. And, and see as feel. it's happening. Because it changes mm -hmm. daily, doesn't it? Even the same set of students, there's a, the different energy sometimes the different days. Isn't oh, there? yeah. It's oh, like yeah. So sometimes the, the energy is high and alive, and other times it's just really low. Yeah. Or it seems like a lot of people are off. And also it could be maybe that I'm off. Right. You know, I... Um, um, and sometimes I feel like maybe I'm doing everything wrong a certain you, day. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I feel that. Um, or like that it's not quite flowing enough. But then yeah. also I have to kind of go with that too. Um, I really feel like, especially teaching, you know, my sort of practice, yeah. it's, it's, it's a practice for me too. It's like, a, I always see it as a skill set. So every time I'm in a Mysa room, I really see it as a practice that I'm honing in on and how can I be more effective? How can I be more receptive to the students? How can I observe them more? Um, uh, how can I tune in to what they need? Um, these types of things are really important for me. And it, it starts to grow over time. And that's why I really, I mean, teaching Mysore is, there's so much growth yeah. for me as a teacher that happens in the room. Um, uh, I feel like it's an extension of my own practice. And I really see it as a practice. In the teaching of the Mysore? Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Nice. And I've noticed that you have a, a real intensity in the room, you know, uh, not, not intense as in deep or <laughs> whatever, but, but an intensity of focus. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit like a, an eagle sort of scanning through the room and you're absolutely there 100% with no distraction or, or whatever, mm. which is, again, refreshing. Don't always see that. Mm. And are you taking in how much of the room are you... I n I, not necessarily while you're doing an adjustment. It seems to be that you actually really are with that person while you're doing the adjustment. But then when you've left them, you can see that my drishti wanders sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, it's purely for the research, you understand. Um, that, that then when you've left that person, it's almost like you're scanning like an eagle would scan for, for a mouse or whatever, mm. um, the room and taking it all in. And what are the sort of, because there must be many draws towards you that, that when you see something and you're used to it, potential areas for more improvement must like pop up like flowers yeah. uh, everywhere. So how do you stop yourself from being maybe drawn to the same individual mm. all the time if, if they need a lot of help or, and spreading yourself around? How do, you, mm. how do you sort of temper that or do you just go with your instincts? I guess, I mean, it might sound like a simplistic answer, but I kind of go with my instincts because you start to see there's cycles within your students. Right. So sometimes students are going to go through a cycle where they need more of your assistance. Right. And then they're going to have to go through a time where they don't need your assistance as much. And sometimes the best adjustment is no adjustment. Right. Sometimes it's like nothing at all and giving them space to figure it out. I think when I look back at my own experience, there's been so many gaps where I've had to practice on my own yeah. that I've really, I've honed in on how to, I've had to, ex I guess I should say I've explored the poses in a way that I had to kind of figure it out on my own. Yeah. And I see how important that is for students to have that space too. So I'm not leaving them out in the cold and I really want them to feel I'm holding the space yeah. and that I'm always there to answer questions. but. At the same time, I think it's good that they, you know, they get my support, but also that I give them space to, so they can start to kind of discover the poses for themselves, yeah. um, and not to micromanage everything that they do. And uh, and sometimes I'll see some things in students that okay, maybe it's not quite, you know, all there. Yeah. And that's fine. I want them to kind of be in that space for a while, and also know that they're in a, a space of, of of acceptance. Like it's yeah. okay that you know you're not fully expressing the pose and that I don't need to you know hover over them every step of the way and yeah. then there's a time where I need to come in and challenge them more yeah. and maybe push them and I yeah. like to push students too. right 
you know, but also I like to make them work. And yeah. sometimes making them work means that they're not going to get that heavy adjustment all the time because yeah. sometimes they get a little bit spoiled. You can get really so. dependent on it, can't yeah. you? Almost yeah. like, I know I'm very hungry for adjustments. I love being adjusted. <laughs> and, and <laughs> but it does make you like, uh, not lazy, but almost, yeah, where's my, where's my adjustment in this that takes me that much deeper? And sometimes, yeah. I don't know, you're right. You can stop exploring yourself, can't you? And mm. rely on the teacher to, to take you somewhere. Exactly. Which is uh, it's very interesting. And a lot of the, picking up on what you said just now, a lot of the people, your regulars that I've been talking to, were saying that you seem to know what they need at particular times. And I suppose this is coming back to what you said just now about not always adjusting. But does that broaden itself as well? Can you pick up on maybe what's going on outside that they're then bringing into the mat? And would that influence how you deal with them in the class? or? Do you mean what's going on in their lives? Well, what they're or? bringing into the shala mm. with them, maybe. Because it seems to be that they're saying that you get a real good feel for whether they need to be, you know, challenged, as you say, right. or, or just get it right at that particular time. Mm. So you're I picking mean, up on something. <laughs> yeah, and I don't really know. It's like, it, I think it goes back to, I don't, there's no real formula for it. It just goes back to observing, yeah. feeling receptive to their energy, being um, tuning into their energy and I'm a real I'm super sensitive and so um, you know there's been times when I could just I, uh, I've been observing a student I can tell yeah. that there was something a little bit off right and um, and even in Sweden it's so interesting because in Sweden people tend to be very like more inward okay so but they I don't show it so much no, no. no but I can I've started to pick up on nuance and then when they talk to me personally or if I just kind of say hey how have you been and then it all starts to come out and I'm yeah. like, ah, you know, it's so interesting yeah. um, how it can be expressed on the mat. And, um, you know, I, I, it's just, my source is just so fascinating. When you see people daily, it's just like you just start to feel their energy and, um, and just going with that gut instinct of knowing when to push and knowing when to kind of like give some space and let go. And um, and the beautiful thing that I've observed in, in, in teaching my regular students is just that life is always changing. Yeah. There's just always this flow of life, and you know, there's birth, there's death, there's divorce, there's marriage, there's ups, there's downs, and I see it through my own students. Yeah. And um, and I just feel really blessed to just f facilitate a space for people to come where they feel like they can just do this practice to heal themselves or um, to grow. Um, and so um, it, is my w it, it is my greatest wish to like give people what they need when they yeah. need it. And I don't think I always get it right, but I try, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> That's I mean, the main thing. yeah, yeah, I just, I try and um, I'm so inspired by the practice, like what it's given to my own life. So I really believe, you know, that it can give to so much others. So um, um, whatever I can do to keep people in that space, to explore this practice, with, with, which ultimately they explore within themselves, yeah. you know, I just, I'll give anything for that, you know, and um, um, it's just been really rewarding. And with way. the challenges in your own life, if you hit mm. lows or whatever, mm. How has the practice helped you in those situations and have you channeled it in certain ways mm. in order to facilitate uh, a, a help on the outside of your life? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the practice has been, uh, has given me so much stability when my life has felt like, you know, topsy-turvy or upside down. Um, but there's definitely been times when it's been hard to practice. You know, I've, hard to I've even go on the mat. Yes, yeah. most definitely. And I even had a period a few years ago where I was feeling a, like um, a lot of fatigue. So I would even come to my mat, and it was even a struggle to like get through the sun salutations. Wow. And sometimes I would have to stop because I just it felt like I just had nothing like left to, to give to the practice, and it was a little bit not just a little bit, it was frustrating yeah. because there's some, you kind of feel like you want to go through, yeah. you want to go through your practice, you want to do your practice. Um, and so 
I had to also grapple with this whole thing of like feeling so self-identified with being able to do what I could do. A cer yes, a certain mat. part in the practice, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think too going through that process was very softening for me to kind of like to, to feel that there wasn't really a reserve of energy and to just kind of go with that and not to push so much against it. But then to at least make the effort to just come to my mat and just see what was available. And, um, and it kind of took a while for me to climb back up. And even now, it's been interesting, like where before this happened, I always felt like it was just steady march. Like I could just, I ha always had it. Yeah. But now I, I feel that I'm climbing, but then sometimes there can be like a low dip for a few days and then it's a climb yeah, and then a low there. dip. So this has been really interesting. And this has been going so, on for what, a few years? Yeah, yeah. So, so I've, quite a challenge. Yeah, and it, it's been, I'm climbing now, but then now yes. I feel like sometimes it's good, there's a variance in that climb. Yeah. Um, but now when I've been reflecting on it, I just see that it's really just softened me further. And, uh, and I can kind of just let go to, to just also just self-identifying what I did before and how I was always kind of able to, to I don't know, even practice at a certain level all the time. And maybe yeah. it has to do with aging or me. I don't know. Um, I think, too, I wasn't maybe taking care of myself as well as I could as far as like yeah. eating properly and all yeah. these things. So um, some things happened within our bodies that we just it's talking to us, telling us to to slow down or to sleep more or, or whatnot. Um, but, uh, but this softening thing is really interesting. And because, so. I mean, you have, you're very strong, physically strong. We can see that in your body. And, but um, you also have a very feminine practice. And is that part of the softening? How do you combine the two? And that there's so many students that I talked to that said, you're so inspiring because you make some of those postures that are, are typically maybe thought of as very male or easier for male practitioners, yeah. maybe pincha or mayarasana or nakrasana, some of those postures. Mm. But you do it with the femininity and, and strength as well. So how do you combine those things? And how do you, how do you work on your strength first of all? I'm asking too many questions. I might start <laughs> to maybe just pick one of those and answer your question. Well. <laughs> I mean, to me, I feel like as a woman, honoring my femininity is a strength. Yeah. So why should I try to act like, be more male or yeah. act like, or have, um, an, a, try to like fill that with more like male energy? Yeah. I mean, we obviously, as men and women, we have both energies within us, but I, I feel like um, this sense of my own femininity within the practice is actually a strength. Yeah. And so... Um, there has to be, you know, especially like, I guess, more stronger type or strength based uh, um, poses. I really feel like that you need this sense of like, you know, this rooting and grounding, but a receptivity right. around um, these strength based poses. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be so like brute. So type hard of and like, brute yeah, force. And, yeah, yeah. And I feel like that's actually not as strong i yeah. feel like that um it blocks the energy a bit so a bit like a tree i suppose if it's rigid then it yeah. gets easily blown over in a hurricane if it gives then it withstands it doesn't it maybe exactly. that same sort of elastic energy mm, mm, i definitely agree with that and so um yeah i i, I like and also just like within one breath, I mean, there's this, there is that inhale, that male energy and within the exhale, there's a softening. So I like playing with both of that, you know, it's like, and also like feeling the energy, like, so riding the energy that wants to go upward, yeah. but then at the same time softening when you feel it and just going with it instead of going against, against it. it. And I really feel like in the practice, it's like you have to feel, you have to feel the energy and open up to it and it carries you. I don't know how to explain it. It's just that, and it, it takes a bit of softening to do that. It can't yeah. be just like, mm. yeah. do you yeah. know, yeah. like robotic or yeah. too military type of style. I mean, I don't know where I'm coming up with that, but <laughs> um, but it can't be too, you see that sometimes with Ashtangis where it can be yeah. like a little bit too hard or yeah. too rigid. And so uh, I think it's so important that you have to open up to it. Um, uh, 
And do you work on, so it's good to have those tools in the box, isn't it? I mean, mm. we, can, we know that you have that strength and then once you've got that strength, you can soften it. If you haven't got it, it's difficult to de do these postures. Exactly. So how do you work on the strength yourself? Do you do it in the practice or do you do certain things that help enhance certain postures? How do you work on building your own? Mm, that's a good question. Um, my big thing, especially when I first started, um, like in the practice, because there were many things that I couldn't do, right. but I really, I really leaned into my weaknesses. Like, and I st say this to students, lean into your areas of weakness. Don't try to get out of it. Don't try to bypass it. Right. You've got to go straight through. Yeah. And, and I remember the first time I started practicing Ashtanga and then it was like, you know, upluti at the end and I kind of yes. saw the teacher do it and I was like, oh, that's so easy. And then I'm thinking, and then I start to like press myself <laughs> up and nothing was happening. You didn't leave the ground? No, not quite. <laughs> it wasn't like, and I was thinking, oh my God, this is shocking. Yeah. Like it looks easy, um, but uh, for me it was like, oh, I want to lean into that. I want to lean into that, that um, there's nothing happening, let's see if something can happen. Yeah. Um, and so uh, for me, I, I, didn't, I never entertained the possibility of just bypassing that. Right. I wanted to go straight through and just see what happened. And how do you meet those challenges? Do you, so you're going straight at it, but do you repeat things? Do you work at them uh, outside and then put it all together or work on parts of it and then combine it? Or do you just, just not avoid it? How do you work on those obstacles that you meet? I act, to be honest, I don't do too much on the outside of the practice, but usually I'll, I, I'll repeat. So okay. I'll repeat something, yeah. but I try, I make sure, and this is something that I learned is I make sure I don't get too obsessive. Okay. So if I, if I'm starting to want to do more than three times, four times, five times, then I, I'm just like, no, like I just want to, I'll just stop right. and then move on. Um, uh, but I also think, feel like with strength, it's so much about focus and then like feeling a sense of. Because there's many times when I've tried certain strength-based poses, you're doing it and nothing's happen happening yeah. at all. Um, especially like something like Ekapada Bakasana. Yeah. When I first tried that, I, it was like I was an elephant. Like nothing <laughs> was like, no, no lift off, nothing happening. But I just, I would just kind of hold where I could and just yeah. feel. Okay, where will the, where does the energy need to go, and then and then just backing off and then moving on. But just having a real sense of focus, right. leaning into that area of weakness where it felt like nothing was happening. I wish I had something more concrete, <laughs> you know, than that. Yeah. But I really feel like it also, it's this focus, the sense of focus um, uh, when, you're, when you're attempting these poses. Because yeah. sometimes I see in students, you know, they try, even if something like Uplutihi, they're lifting up and they're just yeah. like, oh, you give up no. too quick. Just give up too yeah. quick. Oh, this isn't for me. Or like, yeah. oh, I'm not strong. Yeah. And um, uh, for me, it's but I, I just would just stay in it yeah. as best I could. Just yeah. stay in it. And that's how you liberate the energy. That's how it starts to awaken. Because um, like you said, some people as well, it's difficult to, to know where you have to direct that energy, isn't it? Mm. So sometimes you're in and you're trying to lift, but you're trying to think, what is it that's got to move in mm. order to to get me up or get this bit up and is that just being more sensitive to what's going on in the body yeah and i th yeah and i think one important thing is this grounding i keep going back to yeah. um so with strength-based poses i always start from grounding okay so where i can connect down into the earth or into my mat into the floor starting from there and having a real strong connection with the ground and then i what i feel is you kind of feel this downward pouring of energy and just also like making sure the hands are in the proper place and and just feeling this connection of just pouring all the energy down and then you kind of feel this rebound of energy coming up um and that's been an important part of my process too, when especially when it comes to things, uh, when it comes to arm balances. And that sort of thing. Yeah.
Yeah. And, and I suppose we could call that like a fundamental of the practice, the grounding. Mm. Is there other fundamentals that you can think of that people could sort of bear in mind for their overall practice and say, okay, are these elements in place? Obviously, the grounding and maybe we can say the breath mm, without mm. taking too many of your <laughs> things away <laughs> right from the word go. But are there other aspects that bear in mind that sort of crop up regularly or that you could say, okay, look at these building blocks to and make sure those are in place? Yeah, grounding, definitely breath, like you said. Um, oh, what else? Um, Like, I, I just find it really important that you feel every part of your body. So there's no part of your body that's, that's unawake or right. dead or, I mean, I'm also big on like, I always, I'm always telling students or even in my own practice, just like even from the tips of my toes, yeah. like all the energy awake, like the legs engaged, um, a strong connection to my core, but it going throughout my whole entire body. So I feel like when the whole body is engaged and is in play, it makes the body lighter, more energetic, um, uh, to feel this coursing of energy throughout the whole body. Um, I just find that really important. I mean, and I tend to, when I teach, it, it seems really silly, but sometimes I'm like wiggling people's toes or I'm tapping their shoulders. Okay, or to I'm, bring awareness to those points. Exactly, especially if I feel like there's a place in the body that just seems a little bit unalive. Right. And I, I, wa I, I want students to be able to explore waking up parts of their body. Yeah. Um, and that's a very fundamental thing. So that's something that can be done in, in standing poses and in, yeah. in, in seated poses. But what I've learned from my own experience is little things become big things. So these little things, when we waken up the body, yeah. when we ground, when we lift, when we pull the shoulders down, um, just having good posture in our postures. Right. So why should the shoulders be creeping up? Yeah. You know, and we don't like, we don't want to sit like this in day-to-day -day life. So the shoulders should be down. Um, I feel like all that stuff carries through in more complicated or more challenging poses. So get the basics, get the, mm. the basic postures as clean as you can, and then that whole... Yeah, exactly, and, or energetically clean. Yeah. You know? It's not necessarily that it has to look pretty, no. but I feel like energetically, um, there should be a sense of align, like um, aliveness in the body, obviously with the breathing, yeah. um, a sense of like, you know, just this uni uni unity, this, I don't know even how to explain it, but just this sense of energy coursing through the body. So there's right. not a lot of like dead areas. Okay. And um, it's... Um, Sometimes you've used the word integrated. Mm, it's exactly. that same sort of thing, that, that same concept that you're talking about now. Yeah, or you can even say it's like fully embodied. Yeah. Like fully embodying the pose. Yeah. Um, um, it's kind of a hard thing to talk about, I guess, because it doesn't seem so concrete. Um, and especially like in, in seated poses too, a lot of times in primary series, if there's like a straight leg out, it's yeah. easy for that leg to be a little bit dead. Yes. So making sure that it's engaged, even though we're not necessarily standing on that leg. Um, it's just important that everything in the body is in play, yeah. even though it might not be the main focus of the pose. Because sometimes as well, it's easy to get all your uh, attention going to that particular bit that's a little bit tighter, mm, isn't exactly. it? And, and then forgetting about everything else because you can feel this, is, this, this bit. And so that's what you're saying. Don't just get drawn to that one spot. Make sure everything else is exactly. working and alive as well. Mm -hmm. That's nice. exactly, yeah. And we're gonna, you're going to... So the jump throughs, jump backs, that sort of embodies much of what we're talking about, doesn't it? This sort of grounding, the strength, the, the flow of energy. Mm. So you're going to do a demo for us at the end and talk through how we can do those things. And um, you're also apparently, and also I've heard this myself too, very good at explaining the, the technical bits of the asana or makes a lot of sense to people when you're saying, okay, you know, you need to do this, this or whatever. Um, and has that come from your own explorations of your own body and your own practice? Or which teachers have you been inspired by and drawn from uh, knowledge-wise? Um, well, it, I think it really goes to all this time I've kind of explored the poses on my own. Yeah. 
but I mean, I've had great teachers that I've worked with. Um, and my first Ashtanga Yoga teacher was a woman, and she was extremely strong. Right. And I think for me to be able to see that at such an um, early part of my practice history yeah. um, was very profound for me. To see a woman that could do things that I thought weren't even possible yeah. for a woman to do. Um, and once I got that into my kind of into my psyche, I was just like, oh, wow, this is this is like uncharted territory. Yeah. I mean, because I started the practice kind of young, I was fairly open, not as open as I am now. Or what sort flexible. of age did you start? So I started yoga around 18, nice. but Ashtanga about 20. Right. Um, so once I found Ashtanga, I was really taken by the like the dynamic yeah. <laughs> part of the practice or how the pra how dynamic the practice was. Um, so uh, with with this all the but then you know I, I've been working with teachers, but there was many times that I was working on my own, and I always like to just kind of pick apart the poses, um, but not in in like an obsessive way, but just really feeling where I could just be more connected right. inside the pose. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's just in my character or something like that, but even the simplest poses, I always kind of want to like explore like new places w inside of it, um, new ways to kind of enter in and out of the pose, um, how to feel more connected. Um, and it's not always about being deeper, you yes. know, or, or things like that, or yeah. or maybe being deeper, but not necessarily like you know trying to be super flat or super flexible yeah. in in the pose yeah. in itself. Um, so uh, just studying the poses um, is something that I I that I've just kind of that has been something a part of me. I don't you know. I Are you a know detailed that. person in in outside life? Do you, do you like a lot of detail in things that you look at, or I'm quite detailed in some things and not in others. Yeah. So I'm a Virgo. So right. yeah, that's quite. <laughs> but yeah, I'm quite detailed uh, when, when of things of interest. But it's either it's all or nothing. With right. Me. So either I'm all in or I'm just like I'm not interested. You're not interested at yeah. all. Yeah. And so when you, when you say that you you play with a posture that you're you sort of you you might have it to a certain level and then you start exploring it. Do you break it down and say, well, I wonder if I could get more rotation here or there or more flexion there, whatever, that would actually make the posture more accessible or a deeper level accessible? Or do you do it in such a way of just feeling how the body goes and not so analytical as far as movements of these joints and that joint? I'm definitely, I, I'm definitely not analytical when it comes to like, oh, is it this joint or this muscle? Yeah. Um, I think part of the vinyasa, uh, the vinyasas in, in the practice, I also study how to like get into a pose more efficiently right. with the breath, so that's kind of part of it. So how can I enter into the pose with as much ease, um, with, with as much awareness as possible, and, and smoothly? Too. Yeah. I kind of I like to play around with that as well. So as I enter into it, as I go into it, and also how to find more space and expansion in the body, and then also how I exit out of the pose. It's really important for me to have that all connected and integrated and flowing from one to the other. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes it's a little bit. Oh, thank God that posture's up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a few breaths. And then, okay, we better get on with uh, the rest of it. So try and try to make it flow like a continual, seamless sort of flow in and out, and yeah, yeah. yeah. But that that sort of, in a way, is the more adept you are at the postures. The sort of it seems like the easier it is to do that sort of thing. But mm. is there a way that we can do that for those that are more challenged with some of getting into some of these intricate postures? I'm thinking of myself now, Mary Chastner D. It's like. I can't ever imagine myself just flowing seamlessly <laughs> into it. I could flow springingly out of it as everything just goes ping and I come out. But, but so how can we embody those same feelings even though the posture might be like really a little bit awkward or a little bit challenging for us to get into? Yeah, I, I mean, I understand it's not so easy for everyone and we were, we're always going through a process. Yeah. Um, I 
I usually give students like things to to work on and to break down the poses. For right. so, so for something like Mari Chasana D, yeah. just getting them into the half lotus position, getting their knee up. But oftentimes I, w I really want students to kind of come in just to be here yeah. and just to get some lift. Yeah. So oftentimes the, what happens is the students just want to jam themselves in and they yeah. don't even think about getting a lift or a deepening in the hip joint. So I'll just tell them, just breathe here for three to five breaths. Yeah. And then hug your knee in and then just twist. Yeah. breathe here and breathe there for like three to five breaths and then from there maybe I'll assist them into it but I try to give them a little bit of a road map to go into it with more awareness yeah instead of right away just kind of slamming their arm this way and being like okay well you know yank me into it yeah and I and, and that's where I it's important that students work um, I want them to 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 find that for themselves and, and just, but even though I'm guiding them, I'm guiding them, yeah. but not get so adjustment heavy where they're just kind of like trying to like curl mm. themselves and get into it any At way any possible. any cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so just taking their time, I think it's important as long as they're leading with their breath. Yeah. And obviously there is like a, you know, there's a vinyasa count, there's, a, there's, yeah. there's this type of method happening, but it, it's better to go in with quality, I think. Than, than fast and furious. Yeah, so. so take a few extra breaths if you need it. Don't don't worry about that, but make it clean and. Yes. Yeah. I think that's very important, um, and I think if you slow down, then you'll be able to speed up. Right. So get it. Get the technique. Yeah. And, and then you can apply a little bit of pace to it. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's a an optimum breath? I mean, I, I know we're all so different, but. Do you think you can be too, the breath can be too long or can be too, sometimes it's like super short. Is there a sort of an optimum range accounting for the, the individuality of some sort of range or scale? Do you but mean like entering so into the pose? Just or? the breath itself as you're mm. flowing through the practice. Do you think that you lose some, I, I know I've been told, I have like, I think quite a super long breath. And I've been told before that, you know, you can become a little bit too grounded or heavy mm. where, uh, where, if it, where it brings a little bit more lightness if it's a little bit quicker. But yeah. then sometimes it seems to me it can go the other way and it all becomes a little bit of a, a race. Right. I think that's very individual, though, because um, I've had some students that are quite like they're lumbering along, right? And so I might give them things to like okay, pep them up a yeah, bit, pick it yeah. up, yeah. Go like you need to start moving a little bit more sometimes. Right. Um, and then there's those students that are real like yeah, they're breathing super fast, yeah. And then just giving them cues to like slow it down, right? Um, but I think it's quite individual in how you give that instruction. Um, I don't know if it, you can. It can just only be one way. No. Uh, but uh, going just going to the opposite. So if someone yeah. tends to be a little bit more like lazy, yeah, I, I like to work with that opposing energy. Right. With students, I think it's good for them to to work with the contrast. Yeah. And that's how things transform. So if you always go to the edge, the you know, to the part that you know that which you're is most comfy, right? Yeah. Right. And you, if you like to lumber along and just kind of yeah. mosey along through the practice, yeah, there might not be that much movement that you, there, yeah. or much change, yeah. Um, and the same thing with those that that go a little bit too fast, they're kind of bypassing something. Yeah. They're not wanting to fully sit in with themselves. And so there's there's usually something that we're trying to get out of, I right. think. And I think it's important to really face that and to face that challenge or to be challenged in that way. Yeah. So sometimes sitting in a pose a little bit longer is very challenging yeah. for some people. And then for others, they could just stay there all day. So Yeah, I get drawn do. down that road. It's like, okay. oh, this is comfy. I think I'll stay here a few <laughs> extra breaths and work it a little bit more. Right. And maybe uh, the lumbering elephant <laughs> 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 needs a cattle prod <laughs> to get me going. So, yeah, I say in my practice, I would have that tendency to like hang around in something because I either I want to like feel a little bit more opening or that it feels nice and I'm just waiting to see if anything else happens. And 
So that can be also be a sort of a, not a negative tendency, but to be aware of those mm. sorts of elements in your practice, is what you're saying, rather yeah. than, than just go with, the f go with your own personal flow. Yeah, I think if you explore this, like picking it up a little bit, yeah. I think there's something new that could arise out of that. Yeah. Um, this, when you when you kind of go with the vinyasas and you maybe just stay with the five breath count, yeah. you start to be carried by this energy, yeah. and uh, there's something very transformative about that, um, and and you can kind of fall asleep a little bit in the yeah. poses. And it's not that it's bad. I don't think necessarily to just to just stay and hold. I think sometimes that's that's good, especially if you're working therapeutically. But there is really something about this staying like with the vinyasas and just to yeah. have this continual movement happening. I really feel it like when I do like like a traditional counted lead class. Yeah. And it's hard for, even for me when I practice by myself, sometimes it's hard for me to maintain that 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 rhythm it's yeah. easy for me to want to like get distracted on something else and maybe like you know I zone out but I feel something really beautiful about just staying with that rhythm um, it's, it's highly transformative it's like you, you feel as if um, there's some type of alchemy happening like within the body um, and not um, yeah like just being carried by this energy by this movement and for those people you mentioned at the very beginning that, that, that you went through a phase yourself when it was like difficult for you to sort of pro get on the mat sometimes or finding it difficult once you got on the mat. Mm. Do you have any recommendations for those that may be facing that now, facing low energy times or, or so much distraction from outside of their life that they're finding it difficult to get themselves on the mat? Mm. Um, well, it, that's kind of, it's, it can be hard to give someone that type of advice, not really knowing like what the situation, what the situation is. Um, I can only kind of speak for myself. Um, just, it's again, just exploring what this yoga is. I mean, I, I, before even teaching, I just feel like I'm still a student of this practice. I'm still learning so much and, um, I also know that it's just not always going to be easy. Yeah. And um, but I've also committed myself to to understanding what this is and to continue on with it. It's very important for me. Um, but these low points can be really beautiful because it just I think it opened me up to something else, to something more. And and some things just are not in your control. And I really felt like the way that this ha kind of came on all of a sudden, the way that it happened, it was just like, whoa. And even though I was like, oh, I was trying to change this with my diet or this, yeah. but it, it was almost like I needed to go through this course of events for whatever reason. And now that I look back on it, it was actually a good thing um, to, and I think I had mentioned this before, and to not be so identified with how I was performing yeah. on my mat. Yeah. It's easy. It's so even though you, in your mind, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I, I'm not supposed to be attached. I'm not attached. You know, of <laughs> <But> course not. <laughs> yeah, but when it happens to yeah. you, you see that there is some attachment. Yeah. And that you are self-identified with it. And that yeah. you have to really look at that. And I thought that was an important process for me to go through. Yeah. It didn't mean that I was just going to quit. Um, I was just going to, I was also accepting the fact that, hey, maybe, you know, maybe I've peaked. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. it comes to the asana, I don't know. Um, or even there was a time at the end of this past summer, I came home, I was having trouble with, there was this, this muscle here with both of my shoulders, right. and I couldn't jump back anymore. Wow. So it was like, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. And so that was a little bit like, whoa, like, yeah. um, this has never happened. Yeah. Um, and you feel, it's interesting how you feel a little bit powerless. Yeah. But then you got to, to kind of look inside and say, well, you know, like everything on the outside of this world just changes. Yeah. So it's going to be happening in the practice too, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. I know with myself, like this week I've been, 
we quite often have a tendency to sort of favor something we're good at, don't we? Yes. And, and so with my, and a lot of people do this, I think, with the jump throughs. You have a way that you cross your legs, which is sort of natural, and, and you do it. And then you might carry on like that for years because every time you've tried it the other way around, it's like really hard. Right. And so I've been doing that this week. I made a pact with one of the girls here that we were going to practice our more difficult side. And so that's what we've been trying to do. But it's that same tendency, like you were saying there, of, of meeting the obstacles. Of course, mm. there's that side of you that thinks, well, actually, it's, I can, it's much nicer and much cleaner when I do it the other way around. So it's quite a challenge to, to stay with that and, and make yourself do it on the other side. And I think you talk about that, creating that balance and creating that integrity as far as switching things around and mm. moving things. Is it quite an important aspect to actually make sure you're s strong both ways, kicking up maybe both legs, depending on what you're doing, that type of oh, thing? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, for instance, if you look at something like a Pinchamayarasana. Yeah. So when I first learned that position, I learned to kick in with one leg right. and I used my dominant leg, which yeah. is usually like I'm, I'm left-handed, so I like to drive up with my left leg. Yeah. Um, but it was important for me to, once I had that established, to learn to do the other leg. Right. And then once that was established, then jump in with bent, bent knees both yeah. at the same time. Yeah. When that becomes easy, then jump in with straight legs. Yeah. When that becomes easy, see if you can press into it. So I, I, I love playing around with that. And you ha also have to, if you're practicing in a group, you have to let go that maybe you'll look stupid. Yeah. That you're falling around or yeah. you're, it doesn't look so good. But um, I, I enjoy exploring those things, exploring um, um, my weaker side. Yeah. And I feel like if you explore your weaker side or explore um, harder entries into positions, then yeah. you really know how to do it. And it somehow that makes a, I know that somehow a few of the, the more natural sides snuck in there when I was doing <laughs> this. And they actually felt easier because mm -hmm. you'd been working then with the, the harder side. So it sort of has a payoff on, on both ways, doesn't it? And creates a little bit, obviously, more balance to the body. Exactly. You're always like uh, crossing the same way or or whatever. Excellent. And so I think what we're going to get you to do now, Laruga, is you're going to get you to demo the jump through, jump back, if okay. that's okay. That's okay. fantastic. Yep. Thanks so much for talking to us. You're and welcome. And uh, it's just brilliant. And I thoroughly enjoyed the last two weeks, just to say that as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so you so much. Thank you. Thank cool. You.